Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me, having me here. It's, it's great to be back at, at KDP. So I know it's been a long day. It's the last, the last talk. So I'm going to be um, uh, making an effort to show you beautiful experimental results from the group of uh, Ben Leff at Stanford uh, with 1D dysprosium gases. And then a theoretical uh, understanding of those results that we can achieve to a very high accuracy because those gases are near integral. I'm, I'm going to be uh, being precise of what I mean by near integrable. And this actually allowed me to put two uh, set of words that, that you, you would think don't belong together. And one is far from equilibrium, and the other one is cars, right? Cars something that is very fragile, and I'm going to be showing you that because the model, uh, the system is near integrable, you can beat them with a hammer or hit them with a hammer, and they will have right, nice uh, coherent dynamics. So let's start with this uh, notion of integrability and near integrability in 1D gases. So if you have these uh, both gases that are very cold, only with contact interactions, so, so no dipolar interactions, so they, uh, to make a one-dimensional system, I have in mind having a two-dimensional optical lattice, you load the gas uh, there, and then uh, the confinement, the transfer confinement is very strong, so they are all in the ground state of the, the transfer direction, and all dynamics happens in one dimension, and that's uh, what is called the single mode approximation. So if you compute what is the, the, the interaction between those bosons that are very cold, you find that they are contact interaction in one way. And now it's very important for the experiments, it's given by this expression, um, and experimentalists can control two things here, the scattering length in three dimension, and they can also control this omega pair. That's the strength of the, of the transfer confinement. Now, if you have bosons that are interacting with this kind of interactions, though this is in 1D, it's a, um, a model that was introduced in the 60s by, by Lip and Liniger. It's an integrable model, if the system is homogeneous. And actually, when this G1D is infinity, is even more integral in a sense. It's something that was introduced before by Girardot. You can map the model into a model of non-interacting bosons. Okay? Now, in the experiments, they, they are trapped, and that's why we start to talk about, we need to talk about near integrability. And the fact that they are really uh, near integrability is something that was beautifully seen by Dave Wise in this uh, quantum neutron's cradle quench that was mentioned before today. And what they do is apply some laser pulses and put all bosons in a superposition of plus minus the momentum of that lattice and let them evolve. Okay? So now Dave, in, on top of these two control parameters, he has an, an extra one, which is the density, because in the Liebliger model, everything is parametrized by this gamma. So uh, he could uh, change this density even though he couldn't change the G1D because he has rubidium. And, and then he look at the momentum distribution function of the, of the gas after a long time. And this is the kind of thing he saw for very large gamma, and even gamma of the order of one. And what you expect in thermal equilibrium is something like this dash line. So it doesn't equilibrate. Okay, so for all the time he could look at them uh, with our big losses, that's what happens. And, and we know that the way to think of those systems after equilibration is one needs to introduce a generalized Gibbs ensemble that is the basis of another idea that I'm going to be discussing uh, later today. Okay, so now you say, like, well, yeah, because he didn't wait long enough. Uh, let me show you how remarkable those 1D gases are. And, and to see how remarkable they are, you need to compare them to 3D. And this was something that, that was done by Ben Leff, uh, uh, Stanford, and now with this prosium, which uh, on top of this contact interaction has a dipolar interaction. So here is what happens. So you see, this is the initial state. This is what I told you all the bosons are in this superposition. And, and this is what happens as a function of time in three dimensions. So this time is in units of the, uh, the time, uh, the oscillation period of particles in the trap, and these are real time in milliseconds. And you see very quickly, seven oscillation period, you get a distribution like the one I showed you before, what you expect in thermal equilibrium, right? So now this is very dilute, okay? So these gases are very dilute, so they seldomly collide with, with another, one with another. So now you do the same in 1D, and now they are going to collide a lot, right? Because most of that empty space that they had before now is not even accessible to it. They are all in these lines, and they are like banging each other all the time. And in the same time, even though have been many, many more collisions than in here, you see that the system is not in thermal equilibrium. 
Okay? So you wait for the same time in three dimensions, atoms almost don't see each other, perfectly thermalized. Now what Ben did then is at this point, you see with that initial state is the same. So he studied the evolution when he rotated the angle of the magnetic field, so when he changed the dipolar interactions. And this, this fact of starting with the same initial state is going to be also important later. Okay? So now you see what happens as a function of time and the number of periods. So you can go to three seconds and then he sees that for zero a degree you get that thermalization is in its time. And then as you increase the, the angle, then you see that the thermalization time decreases. So he could control the time that it took the system to get to thermal equilibrium. And now you can look at the distance, right? You can look at the distance. I'm going to be using that measure later too. Is the, say, like the area between the real curve and the, the thermal equilibrium curve. And you can plot it as a function of time. And what you see in this near integrable system is this. You see some fast dynamics and something is slow. And you can do that for different angles. You can fit this part with something that is exponential. You get a rate and, and it looks like the rate changes with the square of the strength of those integrability breaking dipolar interactions so it's some sort of Fermi golden rule. And this is something that we have seen also. You can take an integrable model like the XXC model and perturb it with next nearest neighbor interaction and hoppings and you see the same behavior fast, slow, with uh, a rate that depends on the integrability breaking square. Okay? Now this is not unique to integrable models as a matter of fact. So even if you have a non-integrable model and you break a conserved quantity, uh, you are going to have a slow dynamics and the same will apply. And actually now we understand you get an integral, a non-integrable modeling which is particle number conservation. You break it and you will have a rate and, and you can calculate it. So with a Fermi golden rule equation. Yeah, question. Yeah, cool question. Uh, 90 degrees. So you go from zero but, to 90. But then you get to attraction? That's correct. So, so you have to be careful because there are two parts of the, so one is the intratube and the other intertubes. Right. So, so that's right. So the magic angle is like a 55, which is zero intratube, but then you still have intertube. But that's right. Intratube, you can have positive and negative. But there's so, no instabilities there once you have attraction? No, there is, a, in this case, because this is the dipolar, because the contact is still repulsive. Remember, this is a perturbation, okay? So there are two parts. There is the, the contact interaction is strong, yeah. and then the dipolar interaction is weak. So no, no problem in this, uh, but I will get into trouble okay, when, yeah. I, when, I use, when, when I show results when the contact itself is attractive. Okay, so you're in the limit when contact is large? Yes. Oh, okay. It's a positive contact, dipolar interaction, you, you change between positive and negative. Okay. I would okay. think there'd be some minimum there where you'd make a liquid or something. No. It's a perturbation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. So that's a, uh, okay, good. So go, coming back to this, so we have these equations and you can actually do numerical experiments with this numerical enclosed expansion and, and see the numerical rates, evaluate this expression and you see it in here, they match perfectly. So, so we understand what is happening. And now I can tell you what is near integrability. This I have in mind the thermodynamic limit, not a finite system. So what it means is that the smaller the perturbation is, the longer it will take the system to thermalize. So the longer is the time scale that you have to see integrable dynamics. Okay, so that nothing, nothing amazing happened beyond some G as a particular value. There is no phase transition, nothing. So if you are in the thermodynamic limit, the closer you get to the integrable point, the longer you will see integrable dynamics. And that's the regime that I'm going to be talking for all the experiments in the rest of the talk. Okay, so that's what I mean by near integrable. Good. Now we can take this near integrability to another level because integrable models, they have quasi-particles, underlying quasi-particles that are infinitely leaf. So for example, for the TG gas would be the free fermions. And, and those things are things you calculate with better answers. And the amazing thing is that now they can be measured in experiments. So this brings me back to something that I was thinking about about 20 years ago. And, and it's what happens is at uh, that time people were thinking about time of flight and so on. And I was like, what happens if you have these 1D Bose gases and you let the particles expand in one dimension on their interactions, right? So if you do that, the momentum distribution function is going to change with time because the particles are interacting. So where do you get? Okay, so now to, to show you where you get, this would be like, let's say, the density distribution in a trap. 
this would be the momentum distribution function of the bosons, even though you can map the bosons to fermion, the momentum distribution function is bosonic, it has a peak at zero momentum, and these are the underlying fermions. Okay, so let's see what happens, I'm gonna let these guys expand, and let's see what happens with this red curve that uh, should start changing because of interactions, okay? So this is what happens, and it's kind of beautiful what happens is, you see, you don't need to expand that much, and that's very important. This a priori, you don't know how, niche, how much you need to expand, but by the time you get two times, three times the initial size, you see that the momentum distribution function of the bosons is identical to the one of the fermions. Okay, so what that tells you is that you do that in the lab, you are gonna be measuring the underlying distribution of these quasi-particles, this rapidity distribution. Okay, so it took some time, and uh, so I'm talking to, to my colleague uh, Dave Wise, and ultimately he did, uh, he did the experiment. So this is now an experimental uh, measurement of the momentum distribution function as a function of this 1D Bose gas, as a function of the expansion time. And you can see that as, uh, uh, initially you have this ground state kind of, of, of looking curve, and at long time it looks like this fermionic curve. Now this is a problem for which I can do precision many body theory because I, we know how to solve this Tom Girardot gas by the map into the fermions. So this is how the distributions look like. And you see, they look very good at long times, but not that short times. And we're gonna do precision uh, calculations, so we also uh, can go beyond just this is a 1D momentum distribution function in the experiments, that's not what they measure. What they measure, they, they actually take pictures, it's time of flight. So they let expand in 1D, release everything in 3D, and then take a picture. So for this model, we can also do that theoretically. So we can do the expansion in 1D, we know everything, and then we can do the expansion in 3D. And this is how it looks like now when you do the expansion in 3D for the same times. Now you see that they look almost the same, so these are on top of each other for different times. Only at, in, at T0 we see a difference. And the reason is that my theory is at zero temperature. So that tells you, and you will see that will be important later for, for Benleff experiments, but at later times, uh, you don't see the difference. Now, more importantly, at late time, we can take the experiment, the theory, momentum distribution function, the time of flight, and the fermionic distribution, and they all lie on top of each other. So it's like uh, the experimental if I actually measure those rapidity distributions, okay? So now comes the, the, the case of uh, what happens when you, you put dipolar interactions, okay? So now let me, let me first uh, come back and tell you what the Hamiltonians is in this case. Uh, we were having questions about it. So you see, we have the bosons moving around in a potential that is harmonic. We have the contact interaction and we have the DDI. Now this DDI with a sing, within the single mo uh, mode approximation that I mentioned before, looks like this, and you see it has an angle dependent, it has a contact part that is, uh, you see, like this, and then it has a regular part. Now this regular part is the one that breaks integrability, okay? So this is the thing that one has to deal with. We are gonna be doing something brutal here in our calculation, we are gonna dump the entire regular part into a contact term, okay? This is on control, I'm just gonna put everything here. You can start playing with how you split it, part contact, part, I'm gonna, everything is in here. So essentially, I'm gonna do the theory for this model. The model is the deep linear model in a trap, but this G1D is the sum both of the contact part that comes because in 3D you have the, the contact interaction and the contact part that comes because of the DDI, okay? All the theory I'm gonna show you has that, so question. But then, that approximation makes a ratio. That's correct, that's correct. That's, uh, that's the whole idea. That's why I will be able to do calculations in here. Okay? And, and, and then the question is, how good those calculations are? And that's, that's, that's what we're gonna change. I'm not gonna do anything with the difference at this level. So this is, this is something that we are working on how you deal with it, but I'm just gonna show you the result that way. Okay? Remember, it's a perturbation, so the, the contact is the most important part. It's the strongest part. That is an excellent question. Now I'm gonna tell you the difference between that and what I'm gonna do next. So you see, this is the difference between thermodynamic quantities and relaxation. So we teach in statistical mechanics the non-interacting gas in equilibrium, right? And then anyone can ask, how does it get to equilibrium if it doesn't have uh, interaction? So if your interactions are very small, 
right? They will bring you to equilibrium, but the thermal equilibrium that they will bring you to is the non-interacting thermal equilibrium. So that's precisely what I'm saying. So indeed, they will lead you to thermalization at some point, but thermodynamically, they make almost no difference. But thank you for that question. I know that's, that's, uh, that's something is very interesting. I'm gonna leave it for you to think about it, okay? Good, so now comes the next level of complication is that Ben's experiments, they are not at zero temperature. He doesn't know the temperature after you load it in, the, in 1D because it's strongly correlated. And the second one is we don't know the distribution of atoms in the tube. Okay, so I'm gonna do a theory, right, in which I don't know, I cannot look at the experiment except after the expansion. Okay, so how is it that I'm gonna do the theory? I have to make assumptions. So these are my assumptions. So I'm gonna say, he loads this uh, BEC in a 2D optical lattice. So I would say, at some point while he's loading, the, the tubes decouple. There is some lattice there, but we, they, they decouple. And I'm gonna make the following assumptions. At that point, all of them decouple, and they are all in thermal equilibrium. So up to that point, it's like they had time to, to move around. So there is only one temperature and one global chemical potential. And I can use now thermodynamic beta ansatz under this assumption to do calculations, okay? So I'm gonna determine the number of atoms in each tube and the entropy in each tube. And why the entropy, I'm gonna show you next. Because beyond that point, still the confinement, the transfer confinement is, is changing and the temperature is gonna change because the process, right, is supposed to be adiabatic. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible calculation that, that we ask each and to, to do, is he has to take all those tubes and given that entropy and temperature, uh, that entropy and number of particles, he has to figure out what is the temperature in each tube. Okay, so, so you see, we are making many theory assumptions here. First, we are assuming that we are ignoring the dipolar interactions, and now we are, for the state preparation, we are, we are assuming all this. So, okay, so what happens when we now compare experiment with theory? So this is in a regime in which you are in the tongue Girardo gas, beyond what you could usually imagine is 420. He has 6,000 atoms. Okay, in the entire cloud. So these are of the order of between 10 and 20 atoms per 1D tube. And this is at this lattice depth decoupling depth. So remember, these two are my fitting parameters. So I take one of these, and if I change the temperature, okay, you see this is again, is an area, is the area between the experimental distributions and my theory ones. And you have a minimum of 15 nano Kelvin. So all these curves are 15 nano Kelvin. So this is the optimal uh, comparison between the theory and the experiment. So you see the theory, you see there are two uh, blue curves. The theory really very well describes the uh, momentum distribution function, and there are some discrepancies in the rapidity distribution. Okay, this I would say is a very good agreement. And now he can also change gamma. This, uh, I was uh, told you before, what characterizes the strength of interaction in the lip linear model by changing the number of particles and also by using a fresh bar resonance. And now when he does that, you see that, uh, well, the agreement is not that good. And also uh, the temperature is higher. Okay, so let me just tell you a few things about this, what we learned from this. So the first one is that actually result, they don't depend strongly on the, on the lattice depth. So it's a good approximation really to think about all the decoupling at the same time. So, so this is reasonable. Uh, another interesting thing that we, we found is that, uh, I mean, he has a way, Ben and his group have a way to, to estimate the temperature of the BEC. All these T star temperatures that we found, they were lower. So, so at that point we said like, whenever you load from 3D to, to 1D, it seems to cool down. And there is actually a very recent paper from Christoph Nagel's group, which is all about that which is uh, cooling by, by dimensional reduction. And the final one, and that's the bad news, that's why it's the last one, is that the theory experiment uh, worsens as gamma T decreases, where the densities increase. And one thing that you can immediately see is just doing some classical calculation if you want, is what is the intertube, something that I didn't even think about. You see 4% of the total energy when you are in the, this TG limit, and, and it's growing as you decrease gamma. Okay, so you expect things to start like disagreeing because simply there are like uh, intertube interactions that I'm completely ignoring and there is also the intratube that I am dumping into the content. Okay, so Leo. Do you have, uh, do you have confinement in resonances here? Yeah. So you, do you tune to those? Or? Yeah, we are gonna cross them, but not okay. here. 
Yeah. Not here. We're going to get there. Yes. So here that's you a, always just positive gamma. That's correct. Here is just positive. Good. So, so now what I'm going to show you is for this case uh, 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 what happens. Okay. So this number of, of atoms. So what Ben can do now again is just go to this gamma, uh, to this angle. The angle is the one that is the 55, which is the in, intra tube is zero. Right, always the same state and rotate uh, the angle. Okay. So one question we had was because of what I was uh, telling to Leo is that can we see an effect of the dipolar interaction? And the answer is you see it in here. Yes, if your gamma is low enough, your gamma is very large, you almost don't see the effect of, of that interaction. Right. Now, uh, how does the theory look like? Well, the theory looks like this. So qualitatively, we see the effect, right, of the rotation by, by changing the, the distribution, but we are nowhere close to quantitatively nailing down these distributions. Okay, a lot of interesting stuff to be done in this regime, and we are, we are working on that. Qualitatively, the Lieblinger model describes what happens in the experiment, quantitative, not quite, okay? Good, so all the rest of the talk is going to be in the regime of, of large gamma, okay? So and this is all these quantum many body scars. So coming back to Leo's uh, question, which is kind of advancing all with my talk. So now we come back to this Hamiltonian, and something that they can do by crossing a feshbach resonance is make this thing <laughs> diverge and become negative. So it become attractive, okay? So, so this, uh, this is an interesting thing that if you do that, um, I mean, theoretically, you can see what happens that uh, you will end up, as you cross that Feshbach resonance, in a very highly excited state of the attractive uh, side, right? Now, this is unstable. I mean, normally you will, like, bosons will come to their clump and, and you will uh, lose your, your BC. What, what ben, Ben's idea was, what if we do that when these uh, dipolar interactions are repulsive? They are going to help avoid that from happening. And they, they published uh, that before, and uh, they could stabilize the, uh, this state. Okay, so that was something that could be done. And uh, now they have to work a bit harder uh, to produce the, the state that I'm going to be showing you that they took out of equilibrium. So this is what happened with the total energy per atom as you change gamma. And this is the repulsive side that we were talking about. You cross the Feshbach resonance, you enter into the, this attractive side, and you see the energy is going up. Okay, so this is a theoretical calculation, and that goes under the, uh, behind the scheme of better answer without string solutions. So essentially, you, you kind of ignore all these uh, bumps of two particle, three particle, and so on. So these three point, these four points are the ones I'm going to be showing you theory and experiment for. And since it will get a bit busy later, I will show always a sketch of these two particle wave functions so that you, you connect to them. So this would be the repulsive case. This is what we call the super tongues. This is infinite G negative. Uh, this is the scar state. That's the one that has the most non-trivial thing. And this is a weakly attractive case, okay? So now let me start with the, now the theory uh, experiment comparison for the uh, super tongues uh, gas. And you see it's similar to what I showed you before. Now let me just show you uh, something I didn't show you before, which is this minimization, this error, depending on this U, uh, the decoupling depth and the temperature. And you see that is minimal at 15 nano Kelvin and very weakly depending on the, on the lattice depth. That's what I have told you before. Now, this is the only fitting that we do, okay? So he gets the state and everything from there is he started like, like, uh, like changing angle, changing Fairbar resonance. So we fit this and, and then we get all resolved for all the state, the repulsive one, the, uh, the scar and, and the, and the weakly interaction. So we don't have momentum distribution function and the rapidities are, reasonably well described. I mean, notice here that when the interactions are weak, momentum distribution functions and rapidities are very similar. As a matter of fact, if the gas is not interacting, they are identical. Okay? Good. So now let's take the dynamics, okay, of these super tongues. Uh, so the dynamics is that we are at uh, this uh, gamma t minus 480, and we do, he does a qu trap quench. So he quenches the trap uh, 10 times the strength. And then we can follow the dynamics, actually. Uh, he can measure the dynamics. We can do the calculation exactly in the Tom Girardot limit. And you see this is momentum, and this is rapidity. I would say the description is, is 
pretty good. And you will say, well, but nothing really interesting is happening. And actually, something very interesting is happening. So if you look at the full width maximum of the rapidity, this is what would be maximal compression. OK, and then it goes back. You see that it just go up and down, OK? So nothing very exciting. Now, if you look at the momentum distribution function, you see that at maximal compression, uh, the momentum distribution function is narrower. OK, this is a really beautiful quantum effect. And this is something that was uh, predicted also many years ago by Mingusi and Gangar. They had the exact solution. And we also saw it with Dave Weiss in that, that paper I, I showed before, except that Dave cannot get to gammas that are 400. So he saw it, but we couldn't describe it with a tons Girardot theory. OK, so that's, that's a, a beautiful effect that is happening here, even though the rapidities are doing something boring. OK, good. Now we can go to the sky state. That's the, the exciting uh, state. So how do we do dynamics there? Well, now we have to use a, a new theory, relatively new from 2016, this generalized hydrodynamics, so in which you forget about the details and you, you create a hydrodynamic theory considering that there are infinite conserved quantities. So now I don't have that much time. This is the equation. It looks like a continuity equation, except that these densities now depend both of the momenta, these rapidities that we were measuring in the experiment, and the positions, and all the interactions really are dumping here. So you have this integral equation, and this two-body scattering lens has everything, OK? So, so you see, given our initial rapidity distribution with this equation, we can study the evolution. And once you get the rapidities, you can compute densities of conserved quantities. So, it's just integrated with this function that depends on the quantity. That's how we can measure density, kinetic energy, interaction energy, and the like. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be showing. So quickly there. So now this is the evolution with GHD, the rapidity distribution after the quench for these three different cases, right? Repulsive, scar state, and attractive. Okay, so they are again very well described by the theory. Right? But if you look at them, you see the differences are not that big. So you say, like, wait, I mean, how can all of them uh, be so similar? And uh, what is interesting to keep in mind is even though the distributions of the rapidities are similar, the underlying quasi-particles are very different. OK? So, so this is now the energy. And by total, I mean kinetic plus interaction. I've been asked, how can the total energy change if energy is conserved? So this is total in the sense of uh, a homogeneous system. So kinetic plus interaction, there is also a trap, okay? That, uh, that's why this can change. And you see what happens for, uh, for these three different states, okay? Nothing particularly exciting. So to see that something really exciting is happening, you have to look at correlations and things like, let's say, kinetic energies. And now you see that they are very different, right? So these are all similar, here not. Okay, so if you look at the kinetic energy, you see that it has a minimum they are at maximal compression in the repulsive case. And this, you can understand why, because interaction energy is absorbing kinetic energy when you get a maximal compression. And here, they are more or less the same. Here is where you see something kind of dramatic happening. Theory predicts that the kinetic energy should go up a lot. The experiment gets a, like a dip, right? As a matter of fact, the experiment looks very similar to the repulsive case. And to see the difference, here are the, uh, the repulsive and this scar state at maximal compression. And you see, at low momenta, they look almost the same. So what is different between those uh, scar state is that you get like high population of high momentum modes. Okay, and that's uh, something that is difficult to measure experimentally, and this is the reason for this disagreement. Anyway, another way to see that this is uh, something interesting is you look, this is maximal compression for the repulsive case. This is maximal compression in here for the attractive case, and you see that it's very different what happens at this maximal compression compared to shortly before and shortly after. Okay, so in here, nothing particularly exciting happened shortly before or shortly after, except that at maximal compression, you have the, the narrowest distribution. But in here, you see that at maximal compression is that you develop those tails. Okay, so then you can try to, and they, they work hard on uh, trying to add a bit of these kinetic energies in here. So of course, there is nothing in here, so there is no change. But if you do that on the scar state, you see that you get more energy, but not quite yet 
describing what is happening in the theory. So really, in the experiment, what is happening is like you have very short range correlations that are very strong, and you end up having these long momentum tails that you cannot see. So if you do, without knowing all this, you are doing the experiment, you look at the attractive and the repulsive, you say like, it's the same state. Because at low energies, they look, they look the same. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop uh, so that we can have uh, discussions. So what is it that I want you to take out of this uh, talk? So these uh, uh, dipolar quantum gases are, are beautiful. Uh, they, for example, allow you to controllably study the effect of breaking integrability in the dynamics, and we could see this pre-thermalization very clearly, kind of uh, theory and experiment. You can see the same behavior. Uh, now, it's a unique, this, this I, I find also very attractive. So it's a unique uh, setup for precision medibody uh, physics with long range interactions, right? This is the kind of thing that you can do calculations and compare to the actual experimental results. And if you are doing a good calculation, you are gonna, you are gonna agree with them. Uh, but uh, it showed the linear model is really a good starting point, but there is still a lot to be learned about this DDI at high densities. And you can also realize these scar states Right? These are highly excited state in the attractive branch, and you can take them very far from equilibrium. Okay? You can do trap quenches, and you see they can oscillate like, like the stable branch. And I show you that generalized agronomic describes what happens with the rapidities, and now what we are working on is on describing the correlation functions to be able to describe the momentum distribution function. So with that, I want to thank my collaborators. So everyone on the left were at some point, was at some point at Penn State. If, uh, most of them moved to, to other places uh, since then. Each end was really all the calculations that I showed you there for the comparison with experiments were done by, by him. Uh, of course, Ben Leff and, and, and his group, uh, and then uh, the support of NSF, and thank you for your attention. Are there questions? Uh, what is SCAR in your SCARs? So, yeah, SCAR is the sense of going to a highly excited state that is atypical, even within the integrable model. So this is, uh, and that then you can, you can study its dynamics and so on. So I don't feel particularly attached uh, to that, uh, so we can discuss over wine in the poster about whether we should call it or not SCAR, but if you have a better idea of how you would call it. The entire, well, nearly integral, because you have the dipolar interactions, okay? So, so again, this is all about, about the fact that it's not a purely integrable model, okay? So as a matter of fact, this dipolar interaction, whose, whose short range repulsive part, is what is stabilizing the whole thing. Uh, so, so maybe follow-ups, and uh, could you please clar clarify in what sense the data about occupations and density profiles, uh, you know, points to this existence of a typical state because that link is a bit unclear. I never show you how the typical states uh, look like in there, right? You would have to put all the strings and so on. So, so yeah, I mean, this state is a highly excited state. You can just do the better answer and put uh, a string states, and you will see they will be all over the place. I never show you any data of the of the typical guys. Okay. But but you, you guys understand what what uh, what is atypical about that state, right? You have an attractive guard in one dimension. What is it going to do? It's just going to clump, right? That's what Leo was asking. So you will have bound state of two particles, three particles, four particles, gazillions of particles, and a thermal state at that energy will have. It's going to be a SU. So this is a very special state with no bound state, no clumps. Okay. That's why it's very atypical uh, for an attractive model, right? Very far from the ground state, right? The ground state has a minus infinity energy, actually, if you are in the thermodynamic limit. Yeah. Other questions? Everyone is ready for the yeah. one. You know? okay. <laughs> so, so what's the intuition for this atypical state, is it? It, it's related to dipolar Okay, so yeah, or how good, good. Kind of... So the, the intuition is the following, right? So if you do, if you do this fresh bath, this quench from the repulsive to the attractive, right? What people had discussed before, 
is that you end up in an eigenstate of the attractive model without bound states. You end up in a highly excited state. Okay, that's what's something that, but of course, in general, this is, uh, this is unstable, right? Now, these are like single particles that are there, right? Yeah, so, so normally what would happen is they would come together and form a bond and then just go out of the trap and the whole thing would evaporate, right? So, but then they stabilize it because of the dipolar, the contact dipolar interaction. But you see, the stabilization is to the level that not only can they create it and put it in there, they can take it out of equilibrium, but now quenching the trap. Okay, this is like, just, just think about scar stating spin models and now do an interaction quen on top of it. It's gonna be <laughs> gone, right? But they can now pre create the state that is highly excited in the trap and quench the trap and do the dynamics. Okay, so that's uh, There's one point I, I might have just misunderstood. So you were emphasizing at various points uh, the integra integrability breaking. Right. But if I understood in the calculations, you replace the dip you kick out the dipolar part That's and correct. only keep. So can you just clarify? So what is the role of integrability right. breaking? Multiple roles. First, integrability breaking will bring you to thermal equilibrium. Now, if it is sufficiently weak, it will bring you to a thermal equilibrium state of the model without integrability breaking. That's the first thing. Okay, does it make sense? So if you're not interacting gas, the interactions are very small, they will bring you to the thermal equilibrium of the non-interacting gas. Okay, yeah. so that's the first thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you kick out the term, so you will not have that effect. Right, because I'm gonna be doing an integrable theory. That's why I'm saying I'm gonna be caring about the short time dynamics that looks like integrable. Now, that said, that said, of course, when we put strong interactions, right, strong dipolar interaction, high density, we see the effect of the dipolars because our model doesn't describe what happens, right? That's beyond the theory we're doing, and it's a theory we want to do, right? But I put that aside because that was all equilibrium because I wanted to study non-equilibrium and see exciting stuff like, like this scar. And what I show you is the scar state it can be well described, right, the dynamics by the, by the integrable theory. Okay, so the model is non-integrable. As a matter of fact, we know it's stable because of this dipolar contact interaction, but I do the integrable theory, and you probably would agree with me that this is pretty good agreement considering that you have 10,000 atoms in one dimension, and I do a blind theory because I don't know the distribution nor the temperature. And I just feed one, temp two parameters, the, the decoupling depth and the temperature, and I do all those different angles that he's doing. I'm not, you know, not feeding every all and, the and, time. And for short times, this can work, and for very long times, it That's can't. correct. Okay. This is one oscillation period. You can do two oscillation periods. Actually, I didn't talk about it, but Dave Wise can do 21 oscillation periods and still can be described. But in his case, he only has contact interaction. So. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing if you want, okay? So that, that you can get it with this agreement this long time. Great. More questions? Yeah, there was one final one over there. Sorry, I think I missed this, but can you comment why when you turn the interaction from positive to negative, the BC, the dipolar PC doesn't collapse? Right, that's, that's uh, what, what, what was asked before because you end up, right? I mean, if you would do it like theoretically, you end up in an eigenstate. So if you do the homogeneous lip linear gas and so on, you end up in an eigenstate, highly exciting state of the attractive case. Okay? But indeed, you know, any perturbation and traps and so on, it should collapse. But they have this repulsive uh, dipolar term that seems to stabilize it to the point that they can do a couple of oscillation periods. We don't see, it, it does decay afterwards, right? So if you only have contact interactions like Dave Wise, you can go 20 periods, it's fine. They cannot do that. But you know, they stabilize it for long enough that they can have one or two periods and you can follow the dynamics as if it would be the integrable model without having those bound states and the like. Okay, any other question? 
All right, so let's uh, thanks Marcus again. Okay.